you can actually understand the bendability if you look at this uh, sketch where you have a service accomplishment. So the service is delivered as specified if you are here in this box. In case a failure happened, you will move from the service accomplishment to the service interruption. And this is a deviation from the specified surface. And usually what you're doing here, you're trying to fix the system. And once you're done with fixing the system, now this is a restoration and you go back again to the uh, uh, this uh, state where you can deliver the surface again. So as you can see, the dependability has relation with failure. The fault is a failure of a component that may or may not lead to the system failure. If you ensure that uh, no failure could happen, then the system becomes 100% dependable, but this is very difficult to be achieved. And uh, you, uh, act, the, your target is actually trying to reduce the failure uh, rate uh, as possible. Now we have some uh, dependability uh, measures. One of them is the reliability, which is the mean time to failure, MTTF. MTTF is equal to one over the failure rate. For a system with an M component or for, with M components, the failure rate of the system is actually equal to the summation of the failure rates of its components. And each of these failures or failure rate of N could be calculated using, using this uh, equation. So we take out the failure rate of N and we plug in one over mean time to failure of N. So the surface interruption, which is actually this box, is the mean time to repair. So you spend some time over here, which is the MTTR. You spend some time until the repair or the fixing finish. So you want to reduce the mean time to repair to the best you can. And once you're done with the restoration, you go to the uh, service accomplishment and the service accomplishment state is actually equivalent to the mean time to failure. So you want to maximize this time. You don't want the failure to happen, but unfortunately it's ought to happen at some time. You want to increase this time as much as you can until the failure happens and you go back to the meantime to repair. So now we can take out this box instead of the service accomplished, we could say mean time to failure here. And instead of this box, we say mean time to repair. So what do we want? We want to increase this time, the mean time to failure, and reduce the mean time to repair. Uh, 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 an analogy to this uh, uh, figure is if you have a car and uh, if it is working, then uh, you are in the meantime to failure. You keep working with the car, uh, do your chores and everything is fine until the failure happens. If the, a failure happens in the car, then you go try to fix it and you wait for the meantime to repair until it's fixed and you go back again to the meantime to fix it. So the meantime between failures is actually a really good measurement for dependability because it's equal to the meantime 
uh, to fail plus the mean time to repair. Now, the availability of the system is the mean time to fail divided by the summation of the mean time to failure plus the mean time to repair. So actually you can take this and substitute it by the mean time between failure. And this is going to be the availability of your system. Now you want to improve the availability as we said by increasing the mean time to failure, which is the uh, uh, nominator or reducing the mean time to repair, which is part of the denominator. You increase the MTTF by fault avoidance, fault tolerance, and fault forecasting. And you reduce the mean time to repair by improved, uh, or improving the tools and the processes uh, that helps you for diagnosis and repair. As an example, to understand these measurements, uh, assume you have a system with the following components. It has only two components, component A and B, and these are the mean time to fail for each one of them. Uh, A has 100,000 hours, B has 250,000 hours. Compute the mean time to failure for the system as a whole. And the answer is we get the total failure rate, which is the summation of the failure rate for A and the failure rate of B. And to get the failure rate of A, you say that it's one over the 100,000 hours. So you have 100,000 hours working without a problem, and then suddenly you have one failure. We could understand it this way. So it's one over the 100,000 hours you get the failure rate of A. The failure rate of B similarly is one over 250,000. If you add them together, it's going to be equal to seven over 500,000. Now the mean time to failure for the system is the reciprocal. So uh, you do this and you end up with uh, 71,428 hours. And you can see the relation between the system mean time to failure and its components is actually having less number of hours than both of the components. Now we move to uh, one of the important subjects of the, of the memory chapter, which is the virtual memory. Now, the virtual memory, we mean we are using the main memory as a cache for the secondary disk storage. And uh, be aware of uh, the other terminology, which is the virtual machine. And that's something else where the host computer uh, tries to emulate the uh, guest operating system. Uh, and its machine uh, resources. Now, uh, the virtual memory is actually managed jointly by the hardware and the software. It's, uh, it's managed by the CPU uh, hardware and the operating system as uh, the software. The programs share the main memory. Each gets a private virtual address, the space holding its frequently used code and data. And this is the first time we are using this word, which is the virtual address. Now, it is protected from other programs. So there is sharing and at the same time, protection. Now, the CPU and the operating system must translate the virtual address or the virtual addresses seen by the hard disk or the hard drive to physical addresses, which is the which actually uh, is the address uh, that the memory or the main memory is expected. So now the virtual machine block is called a page, and the virtual machine translation 
uh, miss is called a beige fault. So if there is a beige that is not in the memory, it's only in the hard drive, this means that we are having, or we have right now, a beige fault. Now, this is what happens for the address translation. From the virtual address to the physical address. And as you can see, here are a list of different virtual addresses. And we are trying to map them to their physical addresses. Notice that uh, the virtual addresses, they are either mapped to the main memory or they are still in the disk addresses or pointing to the disk. So these virtual addresses, either they are pointing to the disk or they are pointing to the memory. Since we have, uh, for example, here in this virtual address, it's from zero to 31, while the physical address is only from zero to 29. So we have 30 bits here and we have 32 bits here. This is only an example. Uh, this tells us that we have many virtual address compared to the physical addresses. And this is why some arrows here points to the same location, which means that there is some competition. Also notice that uh, the, uh, this mapping is happening randomly, and we will explain how we are doing this. At this point here, we are assuming that the beige size is 4K. And since the beige size is 4K, this is 2 to the power of 12. The beige size tells us what is the beige offset. And notice that the beige offset, we copy it from the virtual address. These are the least significant bits from 0 to 11, since we have 12 bits. And we copy it as is to the physical address from 0 to 11. Now, the translation job is to convert the virtual page number to physical page number. Now, if a page fault happened, which means that the, uh, uh, the, the page is not in the main memory, it's only in the hard drive. So in a page, on a page fault, the page must be fetched from the disk. This will take a million of clock cycles, and it is handled by the operating system code. So it's in the system mode, not in the user mode. The user can't do this. Actually, if the user by somehow tries to do this, he will have some warning message from the operating system that it tells that the user is not allowed to do certain operation that accesses the uh, pieces of hardware related to uh, beige fault handling. You try actually to minimize the page fault rate. To do this, you do fully associative placement and smart replacement policies and algorithms. By using large pages, and usually we use 32 kilobyte or 64 kilobyte, we are trying actually to amortize the miss penalty. So now we will uh, have the beige table. And the beige table actually is the one responsible for this translation. And now we will get to the detail of the translation from the virtual beige number to the physical beige number. Now, 
The base tables stores the placement information. It contains an array of page table entries, PTE, indexed by the virtual page number. Now the page table registered in CPU points at, uh, uh, I mean the page table register, there's a register for the page table in the CPU, which points to the beginning of the page table in the physical menu. So every time you want to access the page table, you look for this pointer and you go there. Now there is two situations. Either the page is presented in the memory and its valid bit is equal to one. If it is in the memory, this means that the valid bit is equal to one. Now the page table entry stores the physical page number plus other status bits like the reference bit and the dirty bit and, and others. If the page is not presented in the memory, then we have a page fault and we need to handle this. The page table entry can refer to location in swap space on the disk to handle the page fault. So this is what happens in the page table. We have a page table register that points to the beginning of the page table. And it is composed of page table entries, as you can see here. These entries are indexed by the virtual page number. And we already said that the page offset, it's based on the page table, or uh, page, uh, it's based on the page size. So if the page size is 4K, that's 2 to the power of 12. So bit 0 to 11 is the page offset and you copy it to the physical address. Now, to find the physical page number, you look for it inside the page table. So you go access the page table using the virtual page number to get the correct location. Once you have a valid bit equal to one, you copy the stored physical page number in from the page table into the physical page number of the physical address. Notice that here we have 20 bits that points to this specific page table entry, and you get 18 bits that represent the physical page number. Now, if the valid bit is zero, then the page is not presented in the memory and there is a page fault. So translation of a virtual address to a physical address is the job of the page table in order to access the main memory, the valid bit must be equal to one. So if the valid is equal to one, this means that this page is actually in the memory. If it is zero, then give up hope. It's not in the memory. It's a page fault. Go get it from the disk. Now, mapping pages to storage. Now, uh, as we've seen before, now uh, some of the addresses points to the physical memory, some points at the disk. But now we know that these addresses should be inside the page table. Now, if you have a certain virtual page number, you go to the page table and look for it. If the valid bit is equal to one, this means that for sure it's pointing to the main memory or the physical memory. If it is equal to zero, the valid bit is equal to zero, then you are not in the memory, it's a page fault, go get it from the disk storage. Now, the swap space, uh, you uh, might see this name when you try to uh, format uh, an, a new machine and you want to install a, a Linux uh, operating system. So they tell you that there is certain area is uh, reserved for the swap space. And this swap space is a space on the disk 
reserved for the full memory space of a process or a program. Now, for the replacements and writes, to reduce the page fault rate, because if there is a page fault, then you have to ask to go for the disk, which takes millions of cycles. So to reduce the page fault rate, we prefer to use the least recently used replacement technique. And for that, we use a reference bit, or it's also called use bit in the page table entry. And we set it to one if it is least recently used. And periodically, we clear this uh, uh, reference bit and we make it zero. And this is happening by the operating system. So if you take some time, for example, and you didn't use that uh, page table entry, then you switch the reference bit from one to zero. And this is the job of the operating system. A page with a reference bit is equal to zero has not been used recently and is a candidate for replacement. The disk write takes million of cycles. So uh, block at once, not individual locations. Uh, you should uh, uh, never use the write through because it's impractical, impractical for the disk. We should use a write back. And since we are using write back, then we need to work, work with the dirty bit. So we have a dirty bit in the page table entry, which will be set when a page is written. Now, you will notice that the address translation would appear to require an extra memory reference. So if you want to go and have an, a memory access, first, you look for the page table entry in the page table, and it is actually in the main memory. So you have one access to the main memory to look in the page table, and after that, you have the actual memory access. So it's like you are you are punishing yourself. You are ac uh, accessing the main memory two times for every reference. So to get away from this problem, we use fast translation using a TLB. TLB stands for translation loci buffer. So the access to page table has good locality. So we why not using a fast cache of beige table entry that is within the CPU. So the CPU don't go to the main memory for the beige table. It goes to the TLB, which is actually a fully associative cache. And we know that the cache is very uh, fast. Uh, so typically uh, you have 16 up to 512 beige table entry and it takes 0.5 to 1 cycle for a hit, and maybe from 10 to 100 cycles for a miss with very low miss rate. So misses could be handled by hardware or software. Now, since the TLB is a cache, expect attack, a, da a data field that are presented there, also valid, and so on. Each tag entry in the TLB actually holds the virtual page number. And each data entry of the TLB holds the physical page number. Now, for every reference, we access the TLB now instead of the page table. We don't go to the page table because it's residing in the memory. We go to the TLB, which is a cache. We go to there first. So other status bits will be needed. So to revisit what we've seen, we said that there is a page table and we have a valid bit here. If the valid is equal to one, it's in the main memory. 
If it is zero, then it's in the disk. This virtual page number is actually pointing to a page in the disk if the valid is equal to zero. Now the problem is, now you go to the page table and it's in the main memory. So that's one access to the main memory. And then hopefully the valid is equal to one and you go again and access the main memory. So that's two accesses to the main. Instead of doing this, we will use the TLB this way. So as you can see, we will take a subset of the page table, usually the ones that we recently accessed, and we put them in the TLB. And to do this, now we're introducing more bits. We have the valid before, and now we have dirty, and we have a reference bit. The dirty, the help us, when you are writing back, when uh, 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 the uh, certain page, if it is written to, then you should uh, uh, flip its dirty bit. If it is zero, then you flip it to one. Now for the reference, this help us in the replacement policy when we are looking for the least recently used. So the reference bit, it tells you that this, this like, recently are used. So you should look for the ones with the zeros that are least recently used. Now, uh, we take a subset of these and we put it in the TLB. Notice in the TLB, we have the valid, we have also the dirty and the reference bits. Now we have a tag, since this is a cache, this is a normal cache. So we have a tag and we have data. The data of the TLP is the physical page number. The tag of the TLB is actually the virtual page number. So what happens if we take this position, for example, this is the virtual page number, and this is going to be the physical page number. This is the tag and this is the data. This TLB is actually fully associated. So you go and look for each one of these entries in the TLB and check the virtual page number against the virtual page number or the tag of the TLB. If they match, then you have the page, the physical page number, and you can do the translation. Now, notice overall that these blue ones are the ones with valid equal to one. There are five of them, and they are pointing to this location. And this one. So these five are pointed by the TLB and also the beige table. Not all of the uh, beige table entry and the page table are also in the TLP. Some of them are in the TLP. So since we have this scenario, we should know what kind of TLP misses that we could have. Now, if the page is in the memory and you have a TLP miss, then this indicates that the page table entry is not in the TLP. That's the only problem that you have. It's not in the TLP. So what you should do, you load the page table entry from the page table, from the memory to the TLP and retry again. And that's it. You could do this uh, using hardware or software. To do it in hardware, you this can get a little bit complex uh, for more complicated page table structures and hardware. Usually this is done in software by having a method or uh, an algorithm, which is the TLB miss handler. When you have a TLB miss, the handler must recognize that the TLB miss before destination register overwritten and raise an exception with an optimized handler and the handler will copy the page table entry 
from the page table in the memory to the TLB, which is the translation local side buffer, which is a cache, and then restart the instruction again. Once it's restarted, it will go check the TLB and it will be a TLB hit. Now, the other scenario, if the page is actually not in the memory, and this means that we have a solid page fault. So we had a TLB miss. We were hoping it's in the main memory. However, it's not even in the main memory. So this is in turn becomes a page fault. Page fault. And the operating system used the page fault handler. Notice that we have two algorithms or two methods. One is the TLB mishandler. And in the case, uh, the page is in the memory. And the other is the page fault handler in case the page is not in the memory. Now, you use the faulting virtual address, which is the virtual address that caused the page fault, to find the page table entry. You load the page from the disk to the memory, and this takes a lot of cycles. You choose you choose one of the pages to replace, and because we are doing the write back, you check if it is dirty or not. If it is dirty, then you write it to the disk first, and this adds more cycles. Now uh, you read the page into the memory and update the page table, and rerun again by restarting from the faulting instruction, which is the instruction that made the page fault. So you can see that we will spend a lot of time to resolve the page fault. Now, this is uh, an interaction between the TLB and the cache. So what happens, now you have a virtual address. This virtual address from 0 to 31. It has a page offset because we said that the page is 4K. So this 12 is copied into the page offset of the physical address. Now, the virtual page number, we said that the TLB is fully associative. And since it's fully associative, uh, uh, associative you should look for or uh, search every page entry until you find the one that matches the virtual page number of the virtual address against the virtual page number inside the TLB. If they match and the valid bit is equal to one, then this is a TLB hit, and you copy the physical page number, which is, which is actually the data, the data of the cache, you copy it to the physical page number. Now, notice in this scenario, the physical page number is also 20 bits. So we have 12 plus 20 bits. So now the physical address is 32 bits, and this is matching the MIPS uh, architecture. And now you uh, reorder the bits or redefine the bits. Now, this is the way you look at the physical address from the translation point of view. And this would be the way you look for it from an access point of view. So you know that there is a byte offset a block offset, a cache index, and a tag. And we've studied this in the previous video. And you can see here uh, that the index is 8 bit. So these 8 bits will index the cache. So you have 2 to the power of 8, which is 256 different uh, uh, cache entries or different cache blocks. Each one of them have its own valid bit, its own tag, and its own uh, data. Uh, now, uh, 
if the cache tag uses the physical address, you need to translate before the cache lookup. And alternative, you use the virtual address tag. There is complication to you due, due to aliasing. You have different virtual addresses for shared uh, physical uh, addresses, but you should work this out. In our case, there was no problem for alignment. This is was 32 bit, and the other one is also 32 bit. Now, we talked about the protection quickly in one of the slides. We need to do memory protection. Different tasks can share parts of their virtual address spaces, but they need to protect against errant access. And we require the operating system assistance for that. The hardware support for the operating system protection, uh, it happened or it, it can be done by many uh, ways. The privileged supervisor, supervisor mode, which is the kernel mode, you have privileged, privileged instructions, the page tables and other state information only accessible in the supervisor mode, and the system call exceptions is the job of the operating system. It's like the system call in the maps. So at the end, here are some virtual memory considerations. We said that for any cache, you should look for four essential parts. The block placement, finding a block replacement on a miss, and the right box. And since now the virtual memory is using a cache, and in fact, this happens in any storage. So the block placement and also finding a block in uh, our case, in the virtual memory, we use full table lookup, which makes full associativity feasible. And this, and this way, we benefit from it in the reduced miss rate. The replacement on a miss, what we are using in the virtual me uh, virtual memory, we should use the least recently used. And since you are using the least recently used, you have some hardware support like the reference bit and so on. The right policy, you cannot use the right through. It must be right back. Only the right back is feasible, given the disk write really long latency. At this point, here are some pitfalls for the memory hierarchy in general. Be aware of the byte versus word address. This is an example. If you have a 32-bit or a 32-byte direct map cache, and you have also four byte blocks, byte 36 will map to block one but word 36 will map to block four. So you should be aware of this. Actually, you get this result uh, by knowing that the block size is equal to two to the power of two byte, we we'll get this from here, since we have four bytes per block, and the cache size is equal to two to the power of five bytes, and we get it from the 32 byte direct map cache. Now, if we want to find the number of blocks, it's going to be two to the power of five divided by two to the power of two, which is equal to two to the power of three, and this is eight. So now we know we have eight blocks in the cache, which means if we want to know word thirty six, we took we we take thirty six mod eight since we have eight blocks, and this would be equal to.
And this is why the word 36 is mapped to block four. But for byte 36, first we need to know which word is it. And to get this, you get the byte 36, you divide it by four and you get nine. And now you know that the byte 36 is actually word nine. And because of this, you can get where does it map in the eight locations of the cache and it's mapping to nine mod eight, which is equal to one. So you can see now the difference between the two. Also, ignoring the memory system, that's another fallacy or pitfall. Ignoring the memory system affects when writing or generating code. The example is iterating over rows versus columns of array. So you should write the uh, members of array uh, row by row inside them. This way you will benefit from the special lookup. Otherwise, if you do it with column by column and you store it in the memory this way, column by column, then you will have uh, large strides which result in poor lookup. In multiprocessors with shared L2 or L3 cache, less associativity than cores results in conflict misses. So you should be aware of this pitfall. More cores needs to increase associativity. Also, another pitfall, extending the address range using segments. This happens in an old version of Intel, Intel 8286, but a segment is actually not always big enough and we should use uh, different uh, address ranges, which makes address arithmetic complicated. So avoid using the segments. As a conclusion remark uh, at the end of this chapter, fast memories are small, large memories are slow. Uh, we really want both. We want fast and large memories and caching gives this illusion. Uh, the principle of locality, we've talked about the temporal locality and the special locality. Programs use a small part of their memory space frequently. Now the memory hierarchy, we've seen it in one of the slides. We have the core or the CVU, the registers are actually part of the uh, CPU or the processor and you have L1 cache and usually it's split it into data and instruction followed by the uh, lower level, level 2 cache and you go low and low until you reach to the main memory or the DRAM memory and from the D memory we can use it as a cache for the hard disk and this is actually the idea of the virtual Memory. The memory system design is actually very critical for multi-processors. 